The, the, the title was liquid metal cooled fast reactors, but I'm going to only be talking about sodium cooled fast reactors. The, the only um, uh, touching on, on lead cooled fast reactors was um, uh, was a, a reactor called the indirectly cooled molten salt reactor, which was a conceptual study um, which was centered at uh, Winfrith, although there was work done at Harwell and uh, um, and grizzly on it, uh, but uh, but that that didn't go very far. That was around 1974. It's just a, 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 an interesting um, sideline. Um, can I have the first uh, slide, please? The second slide, please. Right. So I, I thought that the best thing, it, because it's so complex, is that I would put up a timeline, and then we'll we'll talk a bit about the the, the various things that were going on. My own role in this was I, I actually joined the AEA uh, at Harwell in 1962 at the age of 16, and I, I I actually made some of the first oxide fuels and carbide fuels in the fuel fuel department as a lab assistant before I went to university. But um, when I came back from university, I initially worked on, on in the plutonium ceramics division on carbide fuels, did my PhD thesis on, 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 on carbide fuel. But then uh, w w started working uh, on developing uh, fuel, fuel performance models and moved to theoretical physics division and worked on uh, radiation damage. But in, in 1979, I became head of the uh, the uh, all of the the fast reactor work at Harwell and the uh, the general nuclear safety program uh, reporting back to the project headquarters in Risley and um, and culture um, so I had a, a very good overview and intended uh, attended uh, a lot of the committee meetings in the critical period in the in the 1970s and 1980s on on the on the fast reactor program um, so, uh, the, from the very start, when when uh, John Cockroft came back from uh, from Montreal in 1946 to set up Harwell, the first management meeting at Harwell discussed a fast reactor program. Um, at the time, there was a, there was a lot of concern that the, there was going to be a, a shortage of uranium. And so the, the breeder concept had already been formulated and people were talking about it in 1946. Um, um, shortly afterwards, um, Risley uh, and Kulchath were, were, were set up. Um, at at Kulchath, they had a very interesting laboratory where they started looking at um, uh, things like niobium as a, a potential cladding material. And uh, uh, they looked at other transition metals and uh, things, alternatives to steels and things like that. Um, at Harwell, they they set up the uh, the first um, zero energy reactor, uh, Zephyr. I think it uh, it was uh, went uh, critical in in a, in about 1953 or 1954, and then in 1960. Uh, the reactor physics and thermohydraulics research moved from uh, from Harwell to Winfrith, which was the new site uh, for for experimental reactors. But uh, Dun Ray was uh, was set up in the, in in about 1954, and the Dun Ray fast reactor were, were started construction at that time, and uh, that 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 operated until uh, 1975. Um, uh, on the bottom, I, I put the v various events that were going on, which were driving the policy at that time. The oil price was uh, was one of the things which were, was keeping people focused on nuclear power, uh, particularly in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen seventies. Um, and then the uranium price also um, in the nineteen late nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties. Um, made it that people wanted to uh, to develop uh, a fast reactor program with uh, with breeding at that time, and the uh, the design was started on PFR in in about 1964, and um, it, it had a long construction period. Um, but there were various issues uh, with, with with the reactor at that time. Um, and it, it only went critical in 1974. And then operated for for about twenty years. Um, there, there was uh, development uh, of the commercial demonstration fast reactor, which project started in nineteen seventy six, um, and 
then that led uh, eventually to the European Fast Reactor Project, where we joined with the, the French, Germans and, uh, and others um, to design a, a large fast reactor. Now, I, I would say that the, uh, the Fast Reactor Programme was an extremely friendly and cooperative programme, which uh, had many contributions outside the UK AEA. Um, the CGB uh, did a lot of work uh, on it. There was um, close uh, connections with the NNC and the and GEC that were, were, were concerned at that time with nuclear power. And then later, when BNFL was set up in the 1970s, BNFL was a partner. Um, it, it all fell apart, of course, in uh, in about uh, in, in the late 1980s. Um, uh, PFR continued to operate to uh, to about 1994, um, and then the uh, by that time the uh, DFR decommissioning program was already uh, established, um, and uh, PFR joined it. Um, what one thing I would say b before we leave this screen is that the 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 whole fuel cycle was demonstrated uh, with, with PFR. Um, there was a, a MOX plant set up at Windscale, and uh, the, initially a Dune, uh, at Dunre, a reprocessing plant, uh, which uh, not only uh, uh, reprocessed uh, fast reactor fuel, it also re reprocessed uh, MTR fuel from around the UK and even abroad. Um, that that uh, uh, demonstrated reprocessing on the DFR metal fuel and later um, closed the cycle with PFR and plutonium extracted from that plant uh, was sent to uh, to wind scale and made fuel elements that they were, they were then uh, irradiated in, in PFR. Uh, the, the other thing it was that we, there, were, there was parallel research going on on alternative fuels, and that, that was done both at Harwell in the MTRs, uh, Dido and Pluto, and a reactor called the materials, uh, Dune Rate Materials Testing Reactor. And these included sodium loops, and uh, there were a whole range of experiments looking at uh, things like carbide fuels and uh, sodium bonded uh, carbide fuels. Uh, the, the program not, then went quiet uh, in, in the 1990s and only picked up again uh, with, with the interest uh, with, the, with the new uh, uh, industrial strategy in, in 2011 and then the uh, subsequent interest in um, uh, uh, advanced modular reactors. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, this is uh, DFR. I won't spend too much uh, time on DFR because it's uh, a bit of a blind alley. Um, it was a metal fuel, uh, fueled reactor, 20% molybdenum uranium alloy clad in, in niobium. Um, um, it, it, it was a very useful reactor and it um, enabled the fuel uh, designs for, for PFR to be tested um, in, in the uh, uh, if you click uh, again, Emily, uh, we, we, there's um, just a picture of the core will appear. That's right. Um, it, it, you see the core is tiny. It, it's it's uh, just over half a metre uh, in diameter and half a metre high, um, the active part of the core. And it was possible to remove the centre of that and, and put in um, loops uh, uh, where, where you could study um, uh, 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 Loss of coolant accidents and things like that, as well as putting in uh, in test uh, test bundles of um, uh, oxide fuel. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, the the one really important thing that came out of DFR was the first uh, observation of um, uh, neutron uh, fast neutron uh, void swelling. Um, that was very significant because it had very big implications on the design of the reactor's core, reactor cores. Um, if, you, if you see the, the, the slide there showing the, the different materials and the swelling, the basic swelling process is about 1% swelling per displaced atom, uh, which is an enormous swelling rate. Um, and um, simple austenitic alloys um, have a, a, a bit of a, an incubation dose and then roar away at that uh, very high swelling rate. 
And um, so when that was observed, um, that that caused consternation on, on the reactor designs and, and precipitated a, a whole new generation of research on, on um, radiation damage studies. Um, by making the alloys more complicated, by, by cold working them, uh, by, by uh, 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 putting stabilization and uh, pre large precipitates to act as um, uh, uh, fine precipitates, sorry, to act as uh, uh, sinks for, for point defects. It was possible to inhibit the swelling. But if you, uh, it was found that ferritic uh, steels, uh, because of their uh, different um, dislocation structure, actually had a much lower swelling than the, than the uh, than the austenitic steels. And a lot of that initial work was was done at, uh, at DFR, and, and was the probably the most uh, important aspect of that. Can we uh, have the next slide, please? Um, this is uh, PFR. It, um, it it's now, we're now seeing a reactor that looks uh, like the the sort of uh, fast reactors that we were uh, uh, we are, were now used to uh, seeing. It, it was part of a generation of prototype prototype reactors like uh, uh, BN the uh, 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 BN 350 in in Russia and um, uh, and Phoenix in uh, in uh, in France but also the um, uh, the poor old uh, uh, Monju reactor in Japan which uh, had a leak uh, in, in its secondary circuit which uh, uh, ended up with the reactor being closed the, the one thing in the table I would point out to you is that the load factor on PFR is very low. Over its 20-year life, its average uh, load factor was um, uh, 20, 26.5 percent. So it spent most of its time uh, uh, not working. So if we, we, we go to the next slide, we, we'll see why. Um, there were structural integrity issues. The, the red issues are issues that were actually manifested in the PFR design and had a big impact on, 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 on it. Uh, the blue issues are ones that were identified and a lot of research was done, uh, particularly at RISLI, in, in, uh, uh, in, in trying to understand the, the, the structural integrity. Um, much, a lot of concern over thermal cycling. Um, a thing, a thing called thermal striping, where cold and hot sodium uh, streams uh, coming up onto the above core structure um, uh, would cause uh, would, thought, would cause uh, high cycle fatigue. Uh, but no failures were actually observed from that. What was observed was um, between 1976 and 1982, 37 leaks in the very complicated um, system of uh, superheaters, evaporators, uh, and uh, and reheaters that that made up the steam generating uh, circuits. Basically, they the the it, it was a poor design uh, with um, inadequate materials, um, and uh, we suffered from from that. Uh, it was horrible going to the uh, fast reactor development committee meetings and being told that the reactor was down again because of, uh, of one of these leaks. And it was only solved uh, by uh, uh, force majeure of, of, of putting in sleeves which were uh, explosively welded onto the tube plates and then um, and then, uh, and then they brazed uh, onto the tubes uh, to, to stop it. And the, all of the superheaters and reheaters were eventually uh, replaced. But there were other other problems as well with uh, with, with sodium um, and NAC, uh, the, the uh, sodium uh, alloy, uh, potassium alloy that was used in the decay heat removal systems, where we, we had um, thermal um, cycling uh, 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 failures in in the in, in the heat exchange the air heat exchanges of the decay, decay heat removal system. There was a major under sodium failure, which uh, was caused by a. a, a, a a bursting disc uh, um, problem, uh, which propagated over 40 tubes, where the, uh, the the temperature, very high temperatures were were uh, which melted the tubes uh, were, uh, due to the sodium uh, water reactions. Um, fortunately, with, there were very efficient systems for dumping the sodium uh, to prevent to prevent the, it propagating. 
And then there, there was, uh, uh, this is uh, something that Andy Sherry will tell you all about, reheat cracking failures in, in stabilised uh, 321 stainless steel. Um, and there were 27 instances of uh, cracking failures, not only in, in pipework, but also in, in one of the uh, uh, superheated vessels. And repair methods had to be uh, discovered, uh, developed to, do, to cope with it. You have the next slide, please. Um, in contrast, the, the fuel experience was, was rather good. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I like to think that I may have contributed partly to that. Uh, there were, we, we irradiated over 98,000 fuel pins with very few failures. And um, uh, we had a low density uh, annular fuel, um, which uh, was, was demonstrated to go in, in a special experiment up to 23.5% burn up which is a phenomenally high burn-up when the original targets for, for burn-up were only about 7%, and they, they were adjusted up to 15%. So the fuel behaved superbly. Um, uh, there was no large fuel swelling because we ran the fuel hot, um, so high temperature gradients swept the fission gas into the centre of, of the fuel. Um, the, the, there was concern over fuel failure because uh, sodium reacts with the fuel to make a, um, a sodium uh, uranoplutonate, uh, which has a lower density, which could force open the failure sites. But that was a slow process and it was possible to detect the, the failures easily. Um, some segregation of plutonium in metallic, metallic phases in the centre of the, the fuel, which was difficult, difficult to solve in reprocessing. Next slide, please. Um, zooming on, I, these are just lists of things that uh, that um, came out of the project. Um, fuel processing, uh, criticality testing, developing of new um, reprocessing technologies, um, demonstration the uh, cleaning of sodium off the fuel assemblies, um, the 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 shearing and breakdown of the uh, the fuel assemblies, um, and then the reprocessing is itself that went on up into the 1990s and storage of spent fuel in both water and air. And then uh, the decommissioning process with um, 1,500 uh, tonnes of sodium and, uh, and NAC uh, recovered and treated and put into safe form for disposal. And then the dismantling of the vessels and equipment and associated structures. And then uh, development of the uh, encapsulated wastes forms. So a huge experience on decommissioning of fast reactors. Next slide. Uh, other benefits? Um, well, I, I, it's again just a list because there were so many of them. Uh, I, I was particularly taken by the uh, acoustic uh, techniques uh, and the ultrasonic techniques using high temperature transducers, enabling imaging and also monitoring uh, using Doppler effects of flow and temperature in the in the fuel assemblies, overcoming the problems of not being able to see through the, the, the coolant. Um, and then the development of the uh, diffraction time of flight NDT at Harwell for crack sizing, on the, which is paid for by the fast reactor program, and all of the chemistry work the early interest in uh, oxide dispersion strengthened alloys, which are now of interest to the fusion community, and the work on creep in creep fatigue, which resulted eventually in the development of the R5 codes, which aided the, uh, the support of the AGR program. And then all the modeling work, um, thermohydraulics, um, sodium is particularly difficult to model because of its um, large volume uh, at, at low pressures, uh, and uh, fuel modeling, which went into accident modeling and chemistry and a wide range of safety models and radiation models and, and structural integrity models, and then all the reactor physics and nuclear data work. Um, so it, uh, th this 40 billion pounds was well spent and of course paid for my mortgage, of course. Uh, um, next slide. Um, just I think safety and reliability activities were so important they have to be mentioned. Um, we, we, 
there were eight important coolant boiling experiments done on, in DFR in, in the loop uh, on oxide fuels, which demonstrated that you could safely boil uh, the, the fuel for quite long periods without the cladding uh, uh, melting, uh, which is an important thing for because if it could boil, you could detect the boiling by acoustics. If you have a complete blockage, um, then you, you can't you can't detect that easily with the temperatures. And as they found in the um, uh, in, in, in the Enrico Fermi one reactor, uh, it, it, there was a book called We Almost Lost Detroit, where they melted, um, uh, I think it was seven subassemblies due to a, a, an inlet blockage. Mind you, that was uh, metal fuel. Uh, um, power strand transients. Oh, there was the Scarabee collaboration, uh, which I, I was in, involved with with, with for staff on uh, a pool reactor um, and we uh, uh, Winfrith and Harwell provided all of the fuel and and um, thermohydraulics analysis of those experiments because uh, uh, we were more advanced than the French at that time and on that and then later on Ca uh, Cabri uh, on uh, sodium uh, loops with pul in a pulse reactor and then we're using PFR fuel in the treat reactor and the, an, and the annu, annular core research reactor at Sandia in the United States. And then rapid transient tests in uh, weapons reactors in uh, UK and uh, at Viper and Silene in France, uh, which we participated in the analysis in. And all of the work on molten fuel coolant reaction studies and optimization of decay heat removal. Um, ne next slide. Um, I'll, I'll just mention briefly the design work. Um, well, the, the one thing to take away from these design studies is that it's very difficult to get the conversion ratio high in, in large reactors and um, doubling times uh, for implementing um, uh, uh, so, uh, oxide fueled sodium fast cooled fast reactors um, it, it are very long. Uh, and it, it's going to be quite difficult to make a design that um, uh, it, it, it's going to be easy to build up very rapidly to have a, a large contribution to the uh, to, uh, to, to electricity generation without reprocessing all of the existing um, irradiated uh, or, uh, irradi spent fuel. And um, the other big problem is the void coefficient, particularly in the larger reactors. Um, uh, though the temperature coefficients are, are really quite good. On economic studies on EFR, um, for nth of a kind reactors uh, showed that it was possible to achieve the same sort of electricity generation costs, including the reprocessing, um, that would make them comparable to uh, PWRs. Um, then the final slide. Um, so these are my questions. Um, can we build an, uh, a sodium cooled fast reactor with a reasonable breeding ratio without a radial ble breeding blanket? And there's a trend not to have a radial ble breeding blanket because of safeguards issues, but it's bad enough without a, 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 with a radial blanket to try and get a decent conversion ratio. Should we stop trying to design sodium fast reactors with steam generators in direct contact with sodium? The, the, the two ways of, of around that, one is to use a, an intermediate molten salt circuit, which gives you the flexibility of heat storage and cogeneration, or going as they, they did with Rolls-Royce uh, for the Astrid French design of putting in a, a helium or nitrogen circuit instead of a, a water circuit and work with a, a Brayton cycle. Uh, what's the right size of reactor for a series production of, uh, of sodium fast reactor that optimizes the price safety characteristics and the displacement damage characteristics and the breeding characteristics? There's, so there's a big program there of optimizing designs. Might an SFR actually be cheaper than a water reactor if you've got the size right as well? And then the issue of local faults which I, I think that people are designing uh, lead cooled fast reactors and metal fuel sodium fast reactors need to take very seriously. So I, I'll stop at that point. Well, I've not overrun too far. Have I? We, we had a little time in the programme, so that's fine. Um, 
that was interesting stuff. It was a big program. Um, so that was very, very interesting. So I think we've got one more speaker in this session and then we'll go to we'll 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 have a discussion.